Good morning. It must be cold out there. That's, that's probably right. I have, yeah, I got shoes, I got socks, I got everything on today. <laughs> well, I looked at the weather last night and said it was going to be like 46 degrees this morning. I don't know. Maybe next year, maybe next week, we never know. You know, a little boy came home from Sunday school one day, and his mother asked him about his Sunday school class, you know, how did it go? What was going on? That type of thing. And, and, she, and he said, well, mommy, he says, I, we, had a new, we had a new Sunday school teacher today. And guess who it was? I said, I don't know. Who was it? The little boy says, it was Jesus' grandmother. <laughs> and, she, and she looked at him and says, how do you know that? He says, well, all she did was show us pictures of him and tell stories about him. So all you grandmothers out there, I think you have that in your DNA. Because I'm on Facebook, and I see them. And my wife does the same thing with our grandkids. So I know it's part of the DNA in grandmothers to brag on grandchildren. But it almost seems like that's exactly what the writer of Hebrews is has been doing in this letter. He's been, he simply cannot take his eyes off of Jesus Christ. And he's writing some, to some very confused and very persecuted and very battered people, these first century Christians. And we heard him say in chapter 7, such a high priest truly meets our need, one who is holy, blameless, pure, set apart from sinners, exalted above the heavens. That's how he describes it. Christ was exactly what they needed. And because this is Scripture that was written not just for the first century Christians, but it's written for all people of God for all times and all ages. So it's also true that what what he's saying to these people is exactly what he's saying to us today and as we go through these, these days, these bewildering days in the 21st century where we don't know where we're going. So this author of Hebrews now turns his attention from his discussion of the person of Jesus Christ to his work and his sacrifice, which we're going to see it takes up the next three chapters as we go through this book. The focus now switches to the cross, and that's where the, vocal, the, the viewpoint goes. And it talks about the bloody sacrifice that took place at Calvary. You're never going to, hear this, you are never going to understand Jesus Christ fully in connection to his cross. And you're never going to understand the cross apart from Jesus Christ. They are, they are tuned in together. And to know one, you have to know the other. They're united. If you've got your Bibles, open them up to chapter 7, if you will. Of Hebrews, and I'm going to read uh, verses 27 and 28. Unlike the other high priests, he does not need to offer sacrifices day after day, first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. He sacrificed for their sins once for all when he offered himself. For the law appoints as high priests men in all their weaknesses. But the oath which came after the law appointed the Son who has been made perfect forever. There is first a perfect sacrifice, and secondly, he was made perfect forever. As a priest, Jesus Christ could find no unblemished sacrifice that he could offer the Father, except Himself. He was the only true sacrificial lamb. And that's exactly what He did. He offered Himself. As a sacrifice, there was found no other priest that was worthy of offering such a sacrifice. So Christ became, in some sense, both the priest 
and the victim. On Good Friday, we listen and read the words spoken by Christ from the cross. With the first three words, Jesus is a priest. He says, Father, forgive them. And he continues and says, for they know not what they do. So he is interceding on the cross for the murderers who put him there and nailed him there in the first place. He turns to the thief next to him and he says, today you will be with me in paradise. He's a priest again. He is ministering grace to this man who is about to taste the death, who readily admitted his need for forgiveness and redemption. He readily admitted to Christ he needed a Savior. And then he turns, he looks at his mother, and he looks at the Apostle John. They were standing at the foot of the cross as he hung there. And he said, woman, behold your son. Son, behold your mother. He is still our priest on the cross, and he's ministering comfort to both his mother and to one of his closest friends, giving them assurance, giving them relationship so they could help each other meet the needs of life. But at that moment, a strange thing occurred. The sun was hidden, and a strange and an unaccounted darkness came across the land in Israel for three hours. And the first words from the cross that came out of that darkness is this plea. He says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Here he's no longer a priest. He's the victim. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's the victim offered as a sacrifice upon the altar, which is called the cross. And when at the end of those three hours, he says, it is finished. He follows that up with, Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. And immediately he died. And in those last parting words, he is still a sacrifice. But it's a sacrifice that is completed com fully and forever the work that his Father had given him to do on this earth. And not only did Christ offer up himself as the perfect sacrifice, he did it once for all. He's done it forever. And that tells us something. That tells us that the cross of Jesus Christ is a timeless event. It's a timeless event. It's not merely historical. You know, we can look back in history and we can go read about the siege at Yorktown during the American Revolution. We can, we can go back and read the history of the Battle of Gettysburg in the 19th century. This is totally different. This is an intrusion of eternity into time. It's a timeless event. It's as though it has been going on forever and ever, and it's been going on ever since the foundation of the world. But at the very same time, it's, it's precisely and perfectly contemporary to who we are today in our lives that we live today. Every age, every age can know the meaning of the cross because it reaches back throughout the centuries to cover all of recorded history. The 13th chapter of the book of Revelation tells us that Jesus quote, was slain from the creation of the world. Slain from the creation. All those people of the Old Testament, all those people who had not known the historical presentation of Christ could be saved. Just as we are saved today because the cross reaches back throughout the centuries into time and as well as it looks forward. You know, from God's perspective, which a lot of times we don't see it from God's perspective, we only want to see it from our perspective, but from God's perspective, the cross of Christ is the central act in all of history. All of history. Everything flows from the cross. It's from the cross that all events, 
events that take place in your life, in my place, events that take place in this entire world. It's where everything finds its meaning. And Christ ministers in a new dimension, an an eternal dimension, if you will. Starting at verse 1 of chapter 8, the writer says, Now the main point of what we are saying is this. We do have such a high priest who sat down at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven and who serves in the sanctuary, the true tabernacle set up by the Lord, not by a mere human being. Every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. And so it was necessary for this one also to have something to offer. If he were on earth... He would not be a priest, for there are already priests who offer the gifts prescribed by the law. They serve at a sanctuary that is a copy and shadow of what is in heaven. This is why Moses was warned when he was about to build the tabernacle. See to it that you make everything according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. You know, the question that is raised is is this one. Where is this kind of ministry of Jesus Christ available? Where do we find it? Where is it? The writer tells us here that it it comes from the risen Christ, who who right now is at the right hand of the throne of God in heaven. He's a minister of the true sanctuary. And as what we just read, this is a sanctuary that is made by God, not by man. Now, if this picture conjures up in your mind, you start thinking about this, is that we are poor, struggling, mortal human beings here on planet Earth, and and Jesus Christ is somewhere out there in a space and a place called heaven. If, If we are thinking that, then we've missed the entire point of what the writer is trying to tell us here. We need to understand that heaven is not out there. It's not out there at all. Where is it? Where is it? We need to understand that heaven is not there. It's not a spatial location. It's not something you can pull out ways or pull out your GPS and find some coordinates and find, okay, there is where heaven is. That's where I'm going to head. Now ways will show me there. You also have to give me the traffic patterns too. The only thing it doesn't tell me is how long it's going to take me to get there. It's not a spatial location. Heaven is within. It's within. Heaven is this new dimension which is as present to you on earth as it is to anywhere, everywhere, anywhere else. Because Jesus once said, the kingdom of heaven is within you. I'm just quoting what Jesus Christ told us. The kingdom of heaven is within believers. And it's going to help us to understand this this concept if we look at what the author says about the pattern. For according to a pattern which was shown to him when when, when Moses ascended Mount Sinai, he received the law. We know that. He received the law from the hands of God. He was told by God to make a tabernacle exactly as he instructed. And he had shown Moses how to do it. And this tabernacle is really a copy, and it's a shadow of what is in heaven. So let's look at the design. Or let's look at the pattern of what this tabernacle portrays to be. Tabernacle makes, is really, really only has three main parts. It's made up of three parts. The greater out of court into which the people could come, the, the Jews could come, Gentiles could not come, they could not go into that court, outer courtyard, but the, but the Jews could, could. And then in the center of the court was a structure. It was divided into two sections. One part was called the holy place, which contained basically certain pieces of furniture, an altar, there was, there was a lampstand and so forth. But only the priests and only the Levites could enter into that place in that building called the holy place. 
And then there was a third part of the tabernacle, it was the rear section. It was about a third of the size of the holy place. And that was called the Holy of Holies. It was separated from the holy place by a large curtain or a large veil. And no one, absolutely no one was permitted to enter the Holy of Holies upon pain of death except the high priest, the appointed high priest who could enter once a year to offer a sacrifice for himself and for the people of Israel. And he did that only on one day. It's a day that we call Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur. So what is this tabernacle? What's this shadow of? What is it a copy of? Because when you break it down, we live in a universe made up of, of really three levels or parts. Very similar to what we're talking about in the tabernacle. There's the physical world. There's the material world. You know, the, the world we can see and touch and feel and taste. The physical world that we can smell. Then we have not only the, the physical world, we have the, we have the mental world. The world of the mind. The world of ideas. Of emotions. Of knowledge. And beyond this, there's a third world. That's the spiritual world. And guess what? That's a huge mystery to us. Because the keys to life, the keys to living, are all in that world. That's where the truth comes out of. The problem is we can't enter that world. No man can enter that world. It is a world separated from us in which we do not have access. Similar to the Holy of holies, where only one man can come in, we can't enter this spiritual realm as well. Mankind's designed to live in all three of these worlds, ultimately. And it's God's intention that we should have access to the inner world or the spiritual world that we're talking about. Because we have no problems at all to live in the worlds of matter, and the mind, we've been doing it since we drew our first breath. We can touch the world, you can taste the world, you can see the world, you can visit the world, you can examine the world, you can explore the world. You can take it apart and put it back together again. You can weigh ideas, you can analyze ideas and, and, and thoughts, you can entertain these thoughts, you can enjoy and be moved by art and by music. But into the spiritual world, you cannot enter. There's only one who can enter that realm, the realm of the holy and the holies, and that's the high priest. And you ain't it. And I ain't it either. It was by means of a cross that the true high priest entered that holy of holies. The cross is really the gateway into this realm of the spirit. And we enter into the realm of the spirit through the high priest, and only the high priest, Jesus Christ. The next section of, the, of Hebrews here, the, the writer begins to unfold to us the marvelous meaning and the insights on life that is granted to us in the cross and in the results of Christ's sacrifice. And, it, and in this section that we're going to talk about, he talks about a new arrangement, a new way of living. And since there is a new arrangement, that suggests that there had to be an old system as well. There had to be an old arrangement. Starting in verse 6. But in fact, the ministry Jesus has received is as superior to theirs as the covenant of which he is mediator is superior to the old one, since the new covenant is established on better promises. For, for if there had been nothing wrong with that first covenant, no place would have been sought for another. But God found fault with the people and said, The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt." because they did not remain faithful to my covenant, and I turned away from them, declares the Lord. The law of Moses, 
was the first covenant. We call them the Ten Commandments. Now, there was absolutely nothing wrong with the Ten Commandments. There is still to this day nothing wrong with the Ten Commandments. But as he says, the fault wasn't in the law. The fault was us. The fault was the people. God did not find any, find any fault with the law. And the reason he found fault with the people is because people misunderstood the purposes of the giving of the law. Even today, many, many, many centuries later, men and women everywhere misunderstand the purpose of the Ten Commandments. It happens all the time. It's very prevalent. The people of the day thought God wanted them to keep the Ten Commandments as the only way they could, quote, please God. They felt he demanded a certain standard. They demanded a rigid, careful, scrupulous observance of the law. That's why the Pharisees went crazy, adding things to the law that had no business being there. What they did not understand, even though God told them over and over and over again, was that God never expected anyone to keep the Ten Commandments. Never expected them to. He knew they could not do it. He knows that we cannot do it. He didn't give the Ten Commandments to be kept. He gave them so that we knew that we can't keep them. And when we know we can't keep them, we know we need what? A Savior. That's the purpose of the Ten Commandments. Now, it was with, they, they were pretty presumptuous about this, the people. You know, they confident they could, they, if they tried to keep it, everything would turn out okay. But when they could not, they would pretend, just like we do today, and, well, I did the best I could. We, we set up an internal standard. Everyone has an, their own standard, if you will. And we accept those standards that we set for ourselves, but, you know, our standards are better than other people's standards. But we honestly try to keep it. Of course, we can't. We can't because fallen man cannot keep the moral law. We can't do it. But rather than admit we can't, we do this wonderful thing. We cover it up. We cover it over. You know, we, we lower the requirements. Or we, we bring up our excuses, our failures by saying, well, everybody does it, you know. And then we get into the comparison act. Well, my sins aren't as bad as theirs, and look where I am compared to those people. And we run into that day in and day out. Beginning with the 10th verse of this 8th chapter, the writer quotes the words of one of the great prophets, the prophet Jeremiah, who many years earlier had informed the people of a permanent program that was yet to come. Listen to what he says, starting in verse 10. This is the covenant I will establish with the people of Israel. After that time, declares the Lord, I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, Know the Lord, because they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest. For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. By calling this covenant new, he has made the first one obsolete. And what is obsolete and outdated will soon disappear. Important for us to understand that this covenant or agreement was made between the Father and the Son. It was not made between us and the Father. It's not made between the people of Israel and God the Father. It is holy between the Father and the Son. But if any man or woman be in Christ, everything in this covenant is available and is applicable to you. 
if you are in Christ. There are four provisions of this new covenant. God says, I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts. Well, here's a great answer to the problem of human motivation that we run into time and again. Have you ever discovered that the problem in your life is not uncertainty as to what is right? You know what's right. You've been around the block a few times. You've known that for a long time. The problem is you don't want to do it. It's a motivational problem. So the new arrangement make provisions for that. We are to look to Christ when we are confronted with the things that we do not want to do or the things we want to, want, to run, want to run away from. When we need a shove, we need to say this to ourselves, Lord, I want to run away. I don't want to go there. I don't want to do that. But you have promised to write your laws in my mind and in my heart that I may do what you want me to do. And then the question is, go out and do it. Then he says, I will be their God, and they will be my people. And when he says that, that's a great answer to our search that we have. Every one of us has a search for identity. We have this search for our desire to belong. The question we always have is, who are we? I mean, really, who are we as, as believers? God says that we are identified with him. You realize what that means? The magnitude of what that sentence says? I will be their God. They will be my people. All, everyone will know me. That's your identification. There is something inside all of us that wants to closely or intimately or, you know, we want to be involved or connected or intimately know some great person. Now, th th we all have that thought, except if you're an Alabama fan right now. I've got to give you grace. But I think we all have that desire to be known intimately by someone who we look to and we respect we look up to. We hunger for heroes. And God says, I will satisfy that in your life. I will be that to you because you will know me. And this holds true even for the youngest and most immature Christian. It's, just, it's not just set for those of us who have been in Christ for years upon years upon years. And then the section concludes with some very, very reassuring words. He says, for I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. Have you ever thought what that really means? I mean, because it's, you need to, it applies to you as, as believers. One of my favorite teachers, uh, I probably learned more from him than anyone, Tim Keller. He puts it this way. He says, God has consigned all of your sins to everlasting forgetfulness. Everlasting forgetfulness. That's where your sins are located. He doesn't know them. He's put them off. He's not bringing them back up. This is the answer to the universal sense of condemnation that we have as men and women. We have all had that experience. I know you have, because I have as well. Where we worry, we fret, in our relationships, because we never know quite where we stand, because we're, sometimes we want to go back to that standard that we set for ourselves and not God's standard, so we don't know where we stand with someone. That also applies to our relationships with God and with other people. But God says that if you are looking to the great high priest, Jesus Christ, who is ministering to you all the effects of his sacrifice, all the benefits of his sacrifice, all the glory of his sacrifice. If you are looking to that and identifying with that and saying, that is me, this is never a problem. Condemnation and starting to compare is never a problem for you. 
One of the greatest verses, in fact, one of my life verses, eighth chapter of Romans, verse number one. I say this to myself almost every day. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You talk about good news? My condemnation is eternal, has been assigned to eternal forgetfulness. He's not going to bring it up. He doesn't know about it. He doesn't remember it. He willingly put it aside. He's always for us. He's never against us. Now, it doesn't mean that he ignores sin, wrongdoing. He doesn't ignore iniquity. But he says, I will be merciful toward it. When we acknowledge, when we confess our sins, there is no reproach, there is no rehash. He's not looking to say, ah, do you remember back when? And you said that you would never, well, yeah, you did. That never occurs because his promise says he's not going to do it. God never gets historical dredging up your past, my past. Now, we like to get historical all the time, especially when someone wrongs us. So we sort of think, well, since I've always had that memory, God has that memory against us. No, 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 no. God never gets historical jerseying up your past. Do you understand that all of this, and this has been great news, all of this is continuously available to you and me. This new covenant with Christ Christ is our high priest. This changes absolutely everything. Now, everything is dependent not on human efforts, not on your efforts, not on my efforts, but it's solely dependent upon the grace of God. And I don't understand it. And you don't understand it. And you will never understand it while you're on this earth until he comes back. The wonderful thing about the new covenant is that makes our relationship to God, God the Father, no longer dependent on our obedience. It doesn't depend on your obedience. It depends entirely upon God's love, His mercy, and His grace. And all you do is accept it Live it, breathe it, and never forget it. Do you pray with me? Lord, there is so much, there is so much good news in this letter to the Hebrews. In fact, there's so much good news throughout the 66 books of this Bible. And we thank you so much for, for being a, a God who loves us so so completely that the good news is beyond our comprehension of what good news is. It's hard for us to take it all in because it is too wonderful. But Lord, when we feel condemned and when we go astray, we need to remember your promises of what you say. And it's not upon what we think of ourselves. It's not what our spouses think of us. It's not what our friends and neighbors think of us. It's what you think about us and what you've said about us. We are in the palm of your hand and nothing can snatch us away. Your love is complete. Your love is divine. Your love is graceful. And Lord, may we live our lives day to day just immersed in the truth of the gospel. In Christ's name we pray this. Amen. Have a great day today.